the lecture along the places of Buddha's life, part 4. The developed people show leniency towards those who is trying to take the first steps. Without leniency of the superior bodhisattvas, it is very difficult to develop in this world. Friends, congratulations! We have reached the palace of the Shakyamuni's clan. Of course, this is not a palace. It used to be the palace here two and a half thousand years ago. It was an ancient Ishwak clan. It, he was a great man. According to some different reliable sources, they lived much far in the northern territories rather than modern Nepal. But at certain coincidence of circumstances, the sons of this man were suggested to immigrate from their country because they were not satisfied for several reasons by their father. Well, who, who so to say, had many passions that could not be realized because of his sons. Accordingly, they were banished. So, these sons went to these lands, and an old sage Kashyapa was there at that time, and they founded a small town on, this ter on his territory. Sometimes later they developed respectively, and about two and a half thousand years ago their earth lives ended. But before they ended their earth life, Buddha Shakyamuni who also belonged to this clan, Shakya's clan, about 10,000 followers of the clan appeared. So to say, 10,000 of people became monks near Buddha. After that, because of some certain karmic causes, all Shakya's clan were destroyed, up to infants. From Shakya's clan, only those who were among the pupils of Buddha Shakyamuni stayed alive, and they also went away in that or another form out of this world. The Ishwakus clan is considered as a very ancient clan that existed on this planet. According to, to various sources, there was different numbers of kings, but the largest number, which is described in the blue annals, it is the Chinese writing which was written on the basis of sutras describing Shakya's clan, this place would probably is the most significant from the point of view that it was here when, for the first time, personally, in those eastern gates where we came, remember, first we walked straight, then it was like a turn, and then we went on. So just in those eastern gate, when Prince Siddhartha decided to leave the palace in search of the path of self-perfection, he was facing Mara, which began to motivate him to further perfect in his prospective life in his palaces, because Buddha Shakyamuni has two palaces, one for winter, another for summer. He was fine. Of course, now you see here a complete desolation, where the large trees put uh, with the building of the bricks with their roots. But uh, once, when everything was prosperous here, and the servants cleaned all the fallen leaves and all the wilted flowers at night, in order that the prince to wake him up, so only prosperity and, so to say, the life flourishing. At a certain stage, when he was tired of uh, this illusion, the prince decided to get acquainted with his country, at least with the city. He was not let to go away. But in the end, he found the arguments for his father. He said that he would be the king, and he wanted to see his people, which loves him. It should be certain connection between him and them. And a holiday was decided to arrange for him, an illusory holiday, where again everything was perfect. But nevertheless, the time which was to intervene in the course of his life contributed to this holiday. First, he saw old, weak people. He has never seen a single old person. Can you imagine? Everything around him was very young, only young. He began to discover further. Eventually, 
he saw a sick person, then he saw the dead one, or rather to say, he saw the corpse of the man. It was a great opening for him. He spoke on earnestly with his friend, and his friend said to him that everything in this world gets sick, grow old and die. It was a great opening for Buddha. He became very sad. He said, how is it can be? It's impossible. Is my father and all my loved ones grow old and die? He was said, yes, this is our life. He said, I disagree. I'm going to fight this. I'll try to find a technique that will allow to get rid of these sufferings, diseases and deaths. So when he met Mara here, the deity of pleasure, does everybody know who Mara is, or should I need to explain? If someone doesn't know, raise your hands. I will explain more clearly. It is a deity that is responsible for the satisfaction of passions, and not just human ones. Similarly, Mara meets the passion of the gods. From the point of view of one of the pupils of Buddha Shakyamun, Mongoliana, Mara controls all the visible worlds, everything that has some form and lives for the sake of these or those pleasures, is in the jurisdiction of Mara. Mara is the main deity. Maybe for you it's a novelty, but from the point of view of Buddhism concepts, of the structure of the worlds. Mara, in the material shown world, is the supreme deity that is responsible for almost everything. When the story of the dragon a question from the audience. When the story of the dragon daughter is described, they say, you are a woman, you can't be Buddha, and that is why you cannot become Tathagata. So to say, to become Buddha, we should first become Einmar, and then only the next stage of becoming Buddha. Not really. Buddha means awakened. Many people can be awakened, but to become Tathagata is likely to overcome the stage of Mara. You need to understand that the passion of the other living beings does not bring you happiness, and this stage is most likely to overcome in some ways, to make some certain conclusions, and then look for some alternative ways than the primitive passion satisfaction. It is really so. I would not make such perils, because the same say Satan, who is poured a lot of insulations, I guess, it is useless to talk about gods while you will not directly build any relationship with them. In this case, it is said that Mara meets passion. But as you were born in a Christian country, the majority of you had formed the worldwide that Satan is something negative, right? Clear. But personally, I do not know him, and I can't say how negative he is, but I was just faced with that fact that many of the concepts in this world that are generally accepted are false. I assume that as long as you don't check on your own experience who is who, to stick labels on somebody or something is just senseless and silly. Clear. But some certain perils exist. If you read the Bible, there is a description of Satan, as you call him, who tried to tempt Jesus. Do you understand correctly, right? So to say, he, Jesus, went for fasting to the desert in order to get rid of some certain obscurations that he had as desires, and uh, the so-called Satan appeared before him, and consequently he was being tempted. This is the only parallel that is drawn between Mara in Buddhism and Satan is in Christianity. So far I have not faced any other parallels yet. But in fact, yes, there is a deity in the Slavic tradition, if you look, called Mara, and as I understand it, it is described as a, the feminine deity, and it is the deity of death, as they said. But friends, you know the concept of death is much wider than the physical death. So to say, there are people who are alive physically, but spiritually they are the dead bodies. So maybe Mara, a goddess in Slavic concept, is responsible 
responsible for the spiritual death, and that is much worse than the material death. At least in the Slavic tradition it is exactly. To die, to die like a hero, it's much more dignified than to live being weak or sick for satisfaction of the passions. At least in the Scandinavian countries, to die with a weapon in the hands was generally considered and it is still remained in the epics the direct way to heaven. Well, in principle, it is logical. If you read Mahabharata, it is especially clearly described in the ninth book of the Karma Parvam, when at the certain stage the warriors were already knee-high in blood, having fought on this field, and everyone was tired already to exhaustion. In my opinion, it was the ninth day, and if I'm not mistaken, uh, was Mahabharata and Karna was in charge of the battle at that time, and at the certain stage the heavens opened, and the soldiers who fought saw the hard reality when Dakini, or as they are called, Apsaras, came down from the heaven and took the souls of the dead warriors who died with weapons in their hands. And the warriors really saw how the process of taking the souls happened when Apsaras took them to heaven. And accordingly, the classic warrior instinct was opened. They began furiously tear each other to be able to go to heaven, because they were so tired of this battle, this life, so to say. And it is really written so in Mahabharata that the death of the hero is, well, very good. So the concept of Mara being responsible just for the death is, um, I believe, a limited version. So to say, Mara here is not responsible for death. Perhaps, perhaps, try to understand one important thing, that in different traditions this deity is called differently. Somebody who is responsible for wealth, most likely, if you draw the certain parallels, everything will be clear. And if you link a long life in this world, you will see that for those people who own large assets and financially burdened, are extremely difficult for the most part, very difficult to be and remain a spiritual man. There is a very rare exception when a person, having large material assets, and at the same time he is still spiritual, but this is an exception to the rule. So Buddha left this city, and there were seven long years of wandering, the searching for different trends and concepts. He practiced different methods. Do you remember the lecture at the Mahakala? Do you remember where there was already a skeleton covered with the skin? So to say, Buddha get himself to the extreme stage of the destruction of his body. So accordingly, what happened then was what happened. He enlightened under the Bodhi tree. In Sarnath, he turned the place. In Sarnath, he turned the will of the law. Uh, here's an important point. When Buddha left his palace, he went to Rajhir. Remember the city of Rajhir, through which we were passing, where the mountain Gritharakuta was, there was his mother's Mahamaya motherland. And the king of that kingdom, Bimbasara, having known that Prince Shakya came to him into the city, he came to the prince and started to talk with him. Why are you so healthy, full of energy? Why did you leave your country? You got everything there. Shakya, famous, you have the greatest clan. You should be proud of this clan. So why did you leave? How did it happen? Well, he explained to King Bimbasara that yes, he really was from the mighty clan, and they were very strong, they could win many, but it turns out that there were some problems they could not win because there were a disease from which they were suffering, and finally death that would win anyone. And he wanted to find a treatment or weapon against those warriors. Disease, old age and death. Then Bimbasara said, 
that if he managed to find that weapon, to come to him as a relative and share this knowledge. Well, as a relative from his mother's side, I mean. And it happened so when Buddha reached enlightenment, and after a number of years, he had already the first students, he came to King Bimbasara and shared his point of view. King Bimbasara was the one who was started by death by his son, Ajita Satru. But before he was started to death, he was a righteous man. Do you remember the mountain Grit Hrakuta? We had climbed the stairs up. There were uh, the longest stairs, so thanks to King Bimbasara, it was created. So to say, he created these stairs from those times. Of course, it has been reconstructed recently, and I even know who has reconstructed it. But it is not so important. I will not advertise some certain organizations, but that King Bimbasara laid the first stone of that stairs. It was a thriving city near Rajhir, or as it was called at the time, near Rajkhriha. There were created all conditions for monks' self-improvement. At the certain stage, the kings, when the Buddha's teaching had already spread, literally con competed for the monks of Buddha to be represented in their kingdoms. This was the equivalence of how to say an integral part of the prosperity of the state. When there is a large, a large number of monks, the king could provide. Is it clear? Well, this means that it is not just a secular state. It does not automatically follows our religion that is adopted, and it was a very new progressive religion at the time. But nevertheless, the people in power accepted in a very good way due to the fact that Buddha was very wise. His wisdom was great, because he could find the needed words for each person, depending on his level of development. Well, of course, his concept of perception of reality resonated with the most sensible people, and indeed, it is a very important story about the mechanism in the priestly traditions in India and, at this moment, it is spoken in this Jataka. Jataka is not very long, but very meaningful. The most important thing is that at, this, at that time, when Buddha began to spread his teaching of the reality perception in India, there were six concepts on their territories. Six large movements, so to so-called spiritual ones, which were incredibly conflicted among themselves. To compare with the modern situation, there were several religious, for example, Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Confucianism, and Zen Buddhism, something like that. Different currents, which on the one hand talked about the way to God, but on the other hand, they used different methods. Clear. So it was the same situation at that time when there were many contradictions between them. But when Buddha appeared, these uh, religion leaders united together. They became made strategies against, against Buddha, because Buddha was the number one enemy for them. Buddha tore to tatters all their concepts from that point of view, and many followers left and became students of Buddha. So to say, flocks became thinner. Well, respectively, they decided to make a big competition, so to say, well, of course, mm, not they exactly, because they didn't have so much courage. Mara also took part in this, and then called Buddha Shakyamuni to take part in the so-called magical transformations. I explain now. In the ancient time, if a person decided to be on the path of the self-improvement, then this path had to lead to minimum five supernatural abilities of the person. The person is on the path of the self-development, should be able to show about five supernatural abilities. They are fly in the sky, walk in water, walk on water, become large and small, become light and heavy, and disappear in one place to appear in the another place. So, if the person didn't show these five supernatural powers, he was not even considered 
than advanced ascetic. So these teachers, they were of course philosophers and not mystics. And of course, none of them could do anything I have just listed. But nevertheless, Mara, in order to harm Buddha, became one of these teachers and showed using the body of uh, this teacher all these five supernatural abilities. And the other teachers thought that this one was so advanced and they were not, and they could not show it well respectfully, and they became proud because Mara filled them with this energy, and they began to call to Buddha, so to say they came to the ruler of the country where Buddha was, saying who they were, and asked Shraman Gautama. They didn't even call him Buddha, because actually at that time nobody called Tathagata Shakyamuni as Buddha. This name will appear much later. So they asked to call Shraman Gautama. Shraman is an ascetic, the ascetic of the Shakya's clan, because Shakya were also called Gautama. Take part in competition. They wanted to show five supernatural abilities and let Shraman Gautama try to show them, and they would then compete and prove who of them was more powerful. And when the king came to Buddha and asked him accordingly to participate, in these competitions, Buddha told that he knew himself when it was time. Well, the king heard the answer of Buddha, but he thought that Buddha agreed. They prepared the ground for this competition, and on the day when it was supposed to be, Buddha went to another state at night competition. Well, and accordingly, they thought that Buddha escaped. So these three, six Brahmanic teachers, Purana, Kashyapa and the other, became proud enormously. They followed Buddha, chased him and almost de demanded in the new state to make the competition with Gautama. So they went to a lot of countries, if I remember. There were probably more than 10 countries. In the end, according to some sources in Bodhgaya, near the Bodhi tree, uh, they, we were, they came and there were already a huge number of them. So to say, there were, from all 10 countries, the rulers of these 10 countries, their escort, so to say, followers, with a large number of servants who helped them to travel, they come together and then Buddha showed these five things, not exactly these five supernatural abilities, but he showed them some phenomenal things. From this point of view, I recommend you to read Jataka, which is called Disgrace of the Six Brahmanic Teachers on our website. It is in the Buddhism part in the collection of Jatakas. There are also 250, and one of them is just this one. So Buddha showed some phenomenal abilities, such as when he was fed, he gargled his mouth after eating, spat out water, and this water began to multiply in front of everybody. It turned into a huge, full-flowing river which was flowed and bent over all these people, created a huge lake, and from this lake it was flowed into another river and flown into the river where it started from. And so it went on with the round starting with the lake. There were huge mountain, or rather not even a mountain. And one day Buddha created a mountain on which there were the huge trees in the form of beautiful fruit, those fruits uh, that people uh, had never eaten before on this planet. Another day after eating, when Buddha was presented some food, he used a toothpick. Then he took the toothpick stuck into the ground, the big tree grew out of it, and there were also huge incredible fruit that saturated all people. The other day, one of the most remarkable, when Buddha made all these people at this meeting, and there were several millions people, it was a huge meeting. He made them all Chakravartins. Chakravartin is a righteous king who turns the will of the Lord. Do you understand the meaning? So to say, the king 
king who rules not just because of his whim. For example, I want something. Hooray! Everyone went for something. I want something in other, and everyone ran, ran for that one. I want it so and so. Hooray! And everyone ran for the other passions of the king to realize them. Clear? No. A righteous king rules a virtue of laws, so to say according to that prescription that his righteous ancestors had left him how to fulfill. So one of the powers of the righteous king Chakravartin is to know the thoughts any person who is before him. So to say he is like the scanner understands the whole man's inner world. And when all these millions of people began to understand each other, they instantly solved a huge number of problems, because many of kings have such things as doubt, fear, suspicious, you know what I mean. And imagine that there is a man burdened with large assets, but the neighboring king suspects something, for example, right? And suddenly they both realize that actually some suspicious, which are based on untruth or falsehood, for example, is it clear? And people found harmony and understanding that is very important for many. I don't know exactly, but it was the time when it was the time for cooking for Buddha. And uh, he said that he needed no food, just wanted a dish. And in my opinion, it was Indra whose turn was to give food. It is the king, the king of the god, which helps to maintain the balance of this world. In my opinion, he served the food. And Brahma was also there. And so there were two, these two deities, Indra and Brahma, who fed this food to Buddha and all the others couldn't eat. They were gods, they never saw them. When they saw these gods with their own eyes, how they fed Buddha, they were, well, how to say, just sat and stared at them. No one had anything, and in the end, I think it was on the sixth day already, at the end, when Buddha ate, Indra gave him a huge throne. It was called the Lion Throne, when the throne is made with the handles in the form of the lion spots. Maybe there were some attributes of the lion on this throne, and when a Accordingly, Buddha took food from Brahma and Indra. He pulled the handle of the throne, and there was a terrible war. The deities appeared who were in charge of maintaining the balance of the worlds, and therefore, well, how to say it clearly, they yelled at these six Brahmanical teachers, and all these Brahmanical teachers were not present. They were sitting just silently in the corner. They were eating this food and didn't touch anyone, but none, nonetheless, the justice had to prevail and the gods could not afford to have these not that uh, insolent fellows, but spiritual freaks who had made such challenges without thinking to whom, well, it should have been a certain justice. So the gods appeared, who were responsible for justice, took the seat, uh, took the seat from under uh, these so-called teachers. They didn't even beat them, actually, they just broke their seats and shouted at them loudly. Well, these teachers ran into the river, which was flowing nearby, and swam back into another world. That was the end. Why am I telling you all this? Because at that time the Buddha's teachings were incredibly widespread, and many kings helped, so to say, imagine a king who understands that there are some certain system of priorities. Of course, he will support those who have certain strength and ability. That is why in Rajhir, uh, after some number of years, after Buddha began to spread his teaching, there were huge apartments and the monks lived quietly well. They wanted for nothing. Uh, it is not even the other world, because this planet has many realities simultaneously. So, Buddha being now under the mountain Grit Hrakuta, uh, he is just in the different parallel reality. Do you understand? Look, today you slept at night. You had some dreams, hadn't you? At the same time, you woke up and the dream world turns, turns as one thing, which you saw, and the reality in which your body lives, that is different, right? 
But there are some dreams in which in your dream you see another dream, so to say you sleep, but not in your dream you see the dream, it turns out as the third reality. And you come from one dream, then from another, and you find yourself in this reality, right? Uh, that is why there is a notion of multidimensionality of the world in which you are. A very simple explanation is that there are parallel realities. You certainly know three vectors x, y and z in physics, which describes the three-dimensional space in some way. If you draw these lines in the other direction, that is minus y, minus x, minus z, it turns out the opposite reality, which is from the other hand, is it clear? So Buddha is simultaneously here and there at the same time, and he is here and at the same time he is not here. Well, he is in, in another reality. Did I explain it to you? Now, most likely, he is not in the material world, because if Buddha was in the material world, he would not allow such a mess. Uh, what is going on now? He would not just allow the situation. All Although it is a difficult topic, I don't want to speak about it. Why? Because some things can be explained differently. The thing is that, uh, remember when we were taking with you, when we were talking with you on the mountain Gritrakuta, it was trying to get out a message to you, the Tathagatas, when, well, I try to explain this again. Look, how does the soul of the person develop? First, the man becomes a user. So to say, he pulls everything to himself. So he tries to understand the world through his five senses, through his sight, touch, taste, smell, etc. At a certain stage, the person understands that to consume is, of course, cool, but it's not far-sighted, and he becomes a producer. He becomes the one who helps the others satisfy what consumers take. So to say, the next evolution, when the person does not consume but gives off, clear? At the next stage, he realizes that these concepts of consumption are pro uh, and production are always faced with problems. So to say, there are economic crises and other problems when demand doesn't meet the offer and the offer do not meet demand and the conflict appears. Then there must be someone who, so to say, can judge or pacify the opposing parties. Consumers and producers, clear. This is the way warriors appear. At the next stage, warriors evolve to such a state that they understand this demand, or rather the problem of this demand, and the offer is infinite. And no matter how much you balance them, they still continue to greedy wish for something, and everything else arises from desires. And warriors at the certain stage realize that the main problem is not offer and demand, but the passions that arise. What happens next? The warrior becomes the pro protector of karma. Well, roughly said, not correct completely, so to say, the warrior begins to treat uh, of the passions, so to say, he tries to eliminate the cause of the passions in order to liquidate these systematic distractions. Then he becomes uh, Brahman from the warrior, or he becomes the sage or uh, the sorcerer, as it was called in the Russian territories. Clear? Did ever Everybody understand it. Are you more or less agree or disagree on it? Perhaps there are some other concepts, I agree, but this describes the most adequately everything what happens next. Now we understand that there are some certain wheels of sages, of sorcerers, of brahmans who are trying to give people knowledge, depending on their evolutionary level. Someone, they say one thing, the other another thing, and so on, and it depends on that fact that the person can understand. Is it clear? Accordingly, these teachers will not also at the different uh, evolutionary stages of their development, right? Now imagine that someone, but it is still necessary to coincide in the projection of reincarnation, so to say, that the consumer takes something then in reincarnates, then he becomes a producer, he produces, produces, then he becomes warrior, then he reincarnates again, again and again, then eventually he understands. 
that he should become Brahman, and Brahmans, the teachers, they also reincarnate and they differ in how many past lives they have and how deeply he understands certain laws shown in the world, even in the demonstra demonstrated world. It turns out that at the certain stage, if Brahman goes from life to life, he becomes roughly said, or rather not roughly, even actually, he must become the teacher of teachers, so to say, he knows all possible ways how to improve the soul. Clear? And these teachers of the teachers are called Tathagata. So to say, this is the highest form of the teacher, who tried all possible ways that only allow the soul, in one or another form, to evolve in his previous lives. Moreover, not only in the human world, but also in all different worlds. Buddha is an awakened person, the person who managed to find the way of getting rid of passions, therefore they are called awakened. I remember it was written there, almost equal Buddha or without the world almost. It doesn't matter, try to understand that any book, no matter how it is great, it is the translation, and the author of the translation will translate depending on his own human worldview. Therefore, Tathagatas, respectively, are the teachers of the teachers, and for many of them it is well, like a center or point of development. When they were discussing with you the path from consumption of the consumer to the producer and finally to Tathagata, the gist was the following, or what I was trying to explain to you. When Tathagata becomes Tathagata, he merges with the rest of Tathagatas on the mental level. The Lotus Sutra says that when Buddha was talking about some ancient events, he, being a Stathagata Shakyamuni at that moment, well, it is actually spoken as the following. With his pure eyes of Tathagata, he saw the events that had happened a very long time ago. Being here in the unit of time, he was at a Stathagata at the same time, he was in the distant worlds. Do you understand this? Because Tathagata's worldview is fully connected, they are always in the constant context with each other. At least there exists such a theory, okay? So Buddha is not in the parallel reality or in this reality. Well, if he wakes up, he connects to the whole galaxy, roughly said, a worldview, uh, world, world view. So he is in the past and in the future and in the present. But don't tell anybody, anybody about that. The question from the audience. Who becomes the gods? Uh, those who didn't understand something, being Brahmanas. Uh, they are not Brahmans exactly. The demigods because become those who on the path of producers had accumulated a huge amount of tapas. So they satisfy passions of the others. They've got so much that everything is created for them. Well, let's look who are demigods in this world yes in this in this world those who have large assets and can use those assets 24 hours a day to satisfy passions they are gods sorry the demigods in this world do you know why because they found the resources in this world well here for example let's call some surname they had made a wrong privatization the loan options were incorrect so they consequently had grabbed something and now they own these assets and rule in some way. Or an example from the Ukrainian side, from the Internet. I smile. Putin is poured by slops. Sorry for laughing. Yes, he's nobody. He has no name. I always smile. Why? No matter who is Putin or Abramovich or whoever, any person who has assets. Why do you think they have these assets? Why can they manage these assets? Why can they make some kind of Olympics, for example? What is the reason? Of course, so to say, people in their past lives have accumulated a huge amount by means of patience tapas, and they convert these tapas to achieve some goals they consider as correct ones. 
Try to understand, this is a huge problem for all Kshatriyas or everybody who manages fixed assets. They just exchange their tapas. Let's have an example of someone. Call any name of a person who is trying to do something. Yes, you have Lukashenko, for example. Well, he's a nice guy. I respect him. He's an adequate Kshatriya who, last time in our last trip, we also had a lady from Belarus, and she said that Lukashenko uh, was unfair and he had pressed everyone, and I was smiling. I asked her, what was the problem with him? Didn't he let her practice yoga? She said no. I asked her why he pressed so. She said that her relatives wanted their child to send to America to study there, but he didn't let. And people just do not realize that. That is why I really respect those leaders who care about their people. Actually, they just found a niche when they do not just satisfy their passions or ambitions at the expense of something. Actually, he don't even his ambitions, sorry, not ambitions, but um, they convert their tapas to benefit for someone. It turns out that they invest their tapas in the prosperity of the people. The that will it be in the end. Right, it's a good investment from their point of view. So they're just trying to support themselves at this level. No more, no less. The question from the audience. It is just the exposed side. It only seems so that he does something for the people, but he does more for himself. Okay, wait, please. Let's speak about Lukashenko. When I hear some critics of any person, because I am criticized very much for some reasons, you know, you know, first I look at the person being criticized because it is the first sign that the person is trying to do something good. Only spiritual freaks are not criticized. They have no problems. It is just peace and quiet. If a person lives like an amoeba, he just lives as a parasite and parasites on someone, and he will be okay with the world around. But just a person begins to do something that doesn't fit with the consumption paradigm or the destruction of the planet paradigm, he will be immediately have problems automatically. Therefore, any person who is started to criticize does something good. Well, how to say? You understand that basically I call them the criticuns who criti criticize this world. They criticize everyone and everything. Their sense of life is to criticize. They are not able to do anything, neither to work. They just call them experts, especially when you start just watch some news you can hear. The experts concluded that, I think, well, parasites, why didn't they say the names of these experts? And this is the most important thing. The essence. Okay, whatever. Well, the point is that you should never judge anyone. Why? Because it is unknown how you would behave having so much tapas being on the place of the person you criticize. It is unknown, but it can be that you would be even worse because any position is caused by any restrictions in the human world. In any case, if the person is not openly destroy his people due to alcohol at least or due to cigarettes or some other primitive things, he's already worth of respect anyway. The question from the audience. I can't say that he is just totally negative. I am not a Belarusian myself. I was not born there, and I didn't grow there. From 2000, uh, I just, uh, let it say, watch the history process of this country. And there are some positive and negative aspects. I agree, it is really so. But again, if you compare Belarus and Russia, you know much more Russian people will not see Russia. How to say? If you take Belarus and Russia, in 2003, the year when the main division happened. Oh, sorry, it was in 1993. Sorry, Belarus has its own problems, Russia has its own problems. But the number of deaths in Russia was much more than in Belarus. Uh, 100%. Because here the genocide was much more hard, or not here, excuse me, there in Russia. In Belarus, uh, due to that fact that at least the food is still quite normal, so it is really so. 
Europe. Uh, we live in Russia, but Belarusian products differ from those sold in Russia. Why are products so terrible in Russia? Well, I just know because some corporations occupy the market and sell. It is another topic, but the point is that those products that are now produced in Belarus, uh, they are at least similar to normal good products, because in Russia these products are much less in fact. Well, I just know the situation. We still buy only Belarusian butter, the same of butter uh, to make ghee butter. But uh, many experiences were made. You come to a Russian shop, you buy butter and try to mail melted butter and just watch. You had five packs of butter. How much melted butter can you get out of five packs? So, as a result, you can get normal butter, ghee, only from the Belarusian butter. Everything else that is produced in Russia is awful. Such leaders are there. They are just freaks, because how such products can be produced or when from the packs of butter you get a very small amount, because everything else is just a substrate. And they feed people with these products. Don't the leader of Russia know about it? They know it very well. The question from the audience. And uh, his hands are in blood too. How to combine all this and study to be non-judgmental concerning the personality? Try to understand that warriors have another system of the world understanding, to put it mildly. To kill 100 people for the life of uh, someone else, they have it, they do it easy. So about disappearing about which you are talking. Yes, they kill easily. This is what I think. The question from the audience. Can they be considered as warriors? Of course, Kshatriya, the adequate Kshatriya, if he is not a Kshatriya, he would have already bent his back and got money from Europe and turned your country into the same Poland or Germany or in Latvia. Yes, uh, well, it is even frightening to remember about Latvia, because of what they are told, it is a complete overkill. But what will happen in 10 years? It will be completely awful, if nothing changes, of course. So, friends, never judge those people who waste their energy assets as something. They say that Gazprom has possessed the resources and gave nothing to the people. Do you know how Arab Emirates, for example, and Russia are compared? Do you know the concept of Arab Emirates? No? You don't know? The maintenance of life of the population due to how to say the rent of the natural resources, so to say all oil that is sold there in Kuwait and almost in all the Arabic countries, they give the percentage to the child who is born. He is immediately given $20,000 on his account. Or it was a good country, well, it was a good from the human's point of view to live in a good condition, in my opinion. It was Libya, uh, Muammar Gaddafi, yes, there was communism according to the Soviet point of view. The child was born, he was given uh, 20,000, free place to live, free education in any university, in any country of the world, all completely free of charge, so to say, just live and develop. The perfect conditions were created for men to live. And what happened? Democracy has come. Try to understand. Well, why do you blame these poor Americans in all these accidents? The Americans are just the muscle of the world power, which is how to say put people where they belong. The tale is in quite different, uh, such small tale, you know. Who prints the money that actually rules the planet now, in fact? Let's look from the other side. So, it is senseless to blame America. It is an unfortunate country, which is in the same situation about which Benjamin Franklin said. He predicted all this, what will happen to America, and actually everything happened, unfortunately. Of of course, you are right, and try to look at this situation, but who showed all this from the uh, other world? Hand. What karma have they accumulated, and how many more decades will it take for the Libyan society, at least, or everywhere, where there were these colored revolutions, or how they are called, orange velvet revolutions, or it was called the Arab Spring, right? How many years do they need for this uh, fratricial war in order to begin to live live a normal life at least. A lot of years. Uh, who accumulate this karma? Where did they ring? 
where did they reincarnate? Who at least might live as human beings? That is why sometimes the world is much better than the Great War. The fact is that how you position yourself on this planet, the same world will be formed around you in the end. If you are the consumer, of course, the system of consumption ne never lead to any good. The more you consume, the fa faster you will lose it all. But if you make some efforts on the same planet, there will be certain conditions and for self-improvement around you and for everything else. So to say, everything depends on the intentions of the person. That is why I hope for something like creating each other problems for someone to develop will not work. The question from the audience. I am from the other hand. When you have some problems, take these problems like as some benefit to yourself. So, this is actually so, but we are talking now about only about material life. People live on the outside. What did our whole uh, discussion begin with? Friends, do not judge those who are trying to rule as they can rule, okay? So even these, uh, how to say, the leaders of this world who are setting off the endless wars on this planet, they will say, well, why do you judge us from your Vedic position? So the problem is that they can reach such a state that the planet will be destroyed, you know? So to say, the planet will be just ruined in one or another form. Buddhism, uh, where, where did he go away? Uh, did he go away? But he was destroyed, he had not gone himself, because the Vedic culture is very radical, to put it mildly. And Kshatriyas are also very radical. If, for example, the kings were under the influence of the Buddhism concept, they continued to develop and reincarnate it in some way. But the most part of them uh, look at the spiritual people like crazy people, roughly said. Well, they are compared with naive children who talk about some kingdom of heaven. Well. What can you expect from them? Yes, that is why they treat them like not very clever people. I wanted to give an example with Lukashenko. The sex are not accepted in Belarus, right? They are pressed more luckily as in the Soviet Union. The answer from the uh, audience. Sect instantly. See? That's because he is like a guard who protects his society. He thinks that his society is right. That is why he pressed them. The same was in India. The question from the audience. Any public organizations are forbidden, only those that he puts forward. It is sensible. Any Kshatriya would have done this. Everything is okay. But the problem is just that what he will remain in the end, when his tapas will end, and now this happy Soviet world of the future, and he may be reincarnated for some time, he has this right. So, Denis, uh, they just destroyed what could be destroyed in 2050 years. Remember when I told you in Bodhgaya how Ashoka wanted to destroy the Bodhi tree, so to say, to destroy this bad thing, right? And there were a lot of such warriors. They were very dogmatic. Uh, the question from the audience. If yogis are the real Kshatras, will they understand? Of course not. He will understand something, of course, but um, only that he will understand clearly. They are very specific people. He needs such broader philosophy. He should be understood that uh, I would, if my company will follow something, the society will come to this. Is it profitable for me or not profitable? No, it is not profitable for me, so it should be liquidated. There is a society in Russia who votes rightly, and Kshatriyas uh, thought that now they are ready for GTO, ready for labor and defense. I read news yesterday. Do you know? It was ready for labor and defense in the Soviet Union, and now, while admission to an institute, the norm of the GTO will be taken into account. They have already done this, but I just uh, read about about it yesterday. Well, accordingly, Russia is preparing for labor and defense. It is quite positive. So, Kshatras can understand only what they, uh, their worldview allows them to understand, mm, but that thing will not allow, of course. Moreover, you need to understand that if even one Kshatriya will understand some things, then the others will think he became a sectarian, at least, okay? I don't think that Kshatriya can choose. Kshatras have a lot of 
of ambition and how to say it, they are like a speeding locom locomotive before staying on one thing or to change the way, so to say, where to shift it. He had to roll on the track for a long time, long time, and only then he will stop with feeling, wit and function, uh, then the points will be transferred and he will go in another direction, it is most likely. There are some people who change their views, but unfortunately they change them radically in one direction, then the same way in another one. So to say, it is even the worst situation. Shatras have more stability from this point of view, but the transition period, yes, it exists. The question from the audience. Are there a very large number in India? In India there is a very large number. When we go along with you, if you want, I will give you an example. Can you see this elephant near this small temple? And here there are some small elephants. This is a very bright example of how religion changes the concept of reality perception. Well, the Hindus have some certain holidays, which are not very beautiful. Actually, uh, well, they kill animals. And in the father of Buddha Shakyamuni, Shudhodana, was also a follower of this religion, when they sacrificed animals, okay? It is the Hindu's tradition. The Hindus still do this there. When we leave tomorrow in Kathmandu, we will pass by such a temple. I had been there for two times with our guys, and since then we don't go there anymore. To watch killing is not very pleasant, nobody likes this. And there is a large temple there, and you know it has just a curious junction. It is far from the road high in the mountains, well, perhaps half a kilometer high. We have to climb up from the road high. There is a huge tree which grows near the temple, and the Swiss built an expensive cableway. Well, it was built, I don't uh, know, maybe 15 years ago. It was new. It was there 15 years ago. Probably it is a very expensive investment. But uh, just imagine to build a cable way in the mountains of Naples on one and a half thousand to the temple where they sacrifice. Where is the logic? So somebody had invested money in this temple to drive their animals and regular kill them. But someone invested money and it was even while the reign of the king of Naples. And they regularly take sheep or sorry goats and the uh, ritual called, consists of cutting off the head of the goat first, then the sacrificer takes this goat by its leg and he has to drag this goat holding his leg around the temple. Here is such a ritual. I repeat once again that it really exists almost every day, especially a lot of this happens on special holidays. Some come there to achieve this, you know, there is such a folk belief, for instance, if a girl can't find an adequate man, her mother says to go to pray to Kali. They take a goat, then bring it to the temple, and there this priest, not the priest, the sacrificer, cut its head to put it mildly. And so they are trying, so to say, to satisfy the passion due to the murder of the others. The cult still exists, so look at these elephant, elephants. And when Buddha started to explain to his father some certain things, the father, his father understood. And do you know how he understood? What is what was really cool? When Buddha first came to his house, there was a dramatic meeting in some way, because for Buddha's father it was a hard hit when his firstborn son, whom he had set all his hopes, ran away from home, and the next morning when he woke up, it was a big table had prepared for him because they wanted to feed him. And do you know what di what he did? He took his cup and went to the city to find something to eat. His father was actually shocked when he knew about this and he said to him that he had prepared some food for him. Can you imagine the situation when uh, his father wanted to eat a Buddha? And then he explained to him that he lived on this planet not just for himself, of course. He would take his food, but he still needed to take care of those people who would be able to feed him. He explained that, therefore, he gave the benefit to them so to say, he was trying to help them, so they could build relationship with them. And his father understood, after his son began to explain him in detail while he does some certain things. The father was in 
enlightened, and gradually he became, roughly said, Buddhist. So he forbid to bring sacrifices into the kingdom. But the people, knowing how to explain it to you, that the sacrifice animal is not the new, but just they used to sacrifice animals. So they began to sacrifice statues of animals. They didn't kill them, they just started to put these statues of the animals around the temples, okay? This is the way the religion is gradually changing. The immortal, how to say, does the same thing. That is why there is a large number of gods in India, which are worshipped, it is really enormous. There are different deities. Well, I don't know. There are about 70 known gods in the pantheon, and there is a cult for each of the deities. And passing by different temples, you can see how people bring offerings to the different deities. Fifteen years ago, the king decreed, it was the royal decree almost, if you were born in a family of Buddhists, you should be only a Buddhist. If you are Christian, only a Christian. If you are Muslim, you should be only a Muslim. If you are Hindu, only a Hindu. And uh, the transition from religion to religion was forbidden at the legislative level. But nevertheless, ordinary people spit and sneezed on this, and they went to all the temples and brought offerings to all the gods. That's the fact. So to say, they come in each temple, first they come to a Buddhist one, then in Hindu temple, and so on. They don't care about all these decrees. If people felt that, well, they can give something to deities, they just gave them, you know? Therefore, the attitude to the gods, that's what you had and what will be some time later. Try to know about the Indian culture. I assure you, you will have much broader view of the fact that presents different uh, religions, and different people build relationship with their gods. Let's try from the other hand. Why should they exist? But suppose that they do exist, because you just live in such a way, and most of people that we do do not look at gods in general. So to say, the gods do not exist for us. And there is a TV, a computer that exists for us. It is logical and clear that no matter whatever they exist in your worldview or do not exist. Let's compare. You are dressed in a jacket of a firm. It was produced, you know, somewhere in Thailand, for example. You don't know those Thai people who cut out, mended, sewed. You just have some jacket, by fact. But you can suppose that they exist, though you have uh, never seen them. Clear? And they did something for you. If you use the product that you did not produce yourself, and then you are like a deity for the producer, you use this, so to say your passions are almost satisfied. That is what gods do. Gods uh, help people to accumulate their experience. Is it clear? By showing this or that form or this or that reality, so that the person can obtain some experience. That is why there is a hierarchy of gods, and it is very clear explained in the Vedic culture. What God is responsible for what? So to say this is to say it in another world, they are managers, or how to say this, minister of education, minister of economy, minister of military, okay? Each God is responsible for its niche, and sometimes they change with each other. From this point of view, I recommend to study the ancient writings, because you will understand things wider. But remember what I told you at the very beginning, Beginning. Who is the most important God in this material world? The answer from the audience. Mara, who satisfies the passion. I didn't say this, it is the opinion of Maudaliana, and Buddha supported him. And I agree, yes, indeed. Let's back to the USA, 1954. Yeah, uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken. They tried to find a methodology for how to say it, how to develop the economy after the war in the United States. And there was one economist, I cannot remember his name now, but some Slavic and European roots, with some Slavic and European roots, who put forward the concept of consumption, so to say, people should consume and we need to give people something and very quickly with a very short shelf life, so that people consume, consume and consume. 
and then have and they have made this concept they do become economically dominate over the other countries but unfortunately nobody thinks about where these consumers transform them this is the main problem no well each deity has uh, his jivatma which also obtains some experience uh, will be that Hagata once I recommend you yes um, I would recommend uh, uh, Mahadev series from this point of view. The life story of Mahadev. It is called so well. Something like that. Uh, look, the conflicts of interest of the gods are shown there. When one god with another or Indra there, uh, I'm very sorry, of course, I bow to Indra. Well, but he's shown there in such a way that, well, he's vicious and, well, all passion are just personified in him. But actually, he is the head of the gods, you know? Well, as uh, Vaishnavas say, the demigods, right? Well, but are they demigods? Okay, uh, all right, all right. Mm, we will go, we will not go into details. They are still for our level. We are people, people, but uh, they have a very different potential. They live many more millions of times than we. They have much more potential uh, than we do. We just can't do some small thing and they have it almost ready. I was looking for different currents, directions, try to understand. I couldn't find the system of rest is so to say the system of development of course you can follow the instructions i was said too but when i follow them uh, there is no answer to my questions why do you follow this and you will not be uh, and you will not be able to answer it unluckily I was not satisfied, and I wanted to understand the main thing, why some certain events occur. But if there is a religion, at least, um, which allows you to live rightlessly, that is fine. After all, notice from what uh, does yoga begin. Yama and Niyama are moral prescriptions, so to say, that any religion actually should give. Sorry, not any. There are some religions that say that they are chosen by God, and they said that they are special and all the rest are not. I do not want to speak about this. All the other religions that say more or less about the community, about the moral requirements, is very important for a yogi. A very good yogi will come out of a righteous Christian. I mean that the person who will stick to moral norms, plus the de to develop himself physically and energetically, he will be a very good person. Do you understand why? Because morality will be filled with the energy and he will will be a harmonious person. The same with a Muslim, uh, a Christian, it doesn't matter, a Zen Buddhist, anyone, the most important thing is moral foundations, because I have already repeated many times in my lectures and gave the examples. Try to understand that if an immoral person starts to practice yoga, nothing good will happen for him in the Vedic culture. Did I answer your question? On the one hand, there is a discrepancy there, and at the same time, there is no. If you stand in front of the teacher and you have something that doesn't work, you will ask the question to help you to solve this problem, or you can say that you will solve this problem yourself. It will be correct in this and in that way. But if the teacher will help you, there is a chance for you to develop quicker during this human life, okay? Therefore, the parampara exists, or teacher's lineage, who help their students, because um, to ask is senseless, but you can praise. For example, or you can ask for blessings, for example. This absolutely does not contradict the Slavic principles. To get blessings is, on the contrary, a real virtue. So to say you step, step over your pride and ask for blessing. The proud man would never do that, for example. Therefore, each person does this in his own way. Maybe someone needs to ask for something, because you can't say that asking for something is impossible in any case. Sometimes you need, or depending on on whom you ask for. If you practice yoga for yourself, you probably shouldn't ask for something. If you ask for the sake of the others, why not? Well, you understand that there is a problem you cannot solve, but you are trying to find some support to help someone. So to say, there are many nuances how you can do. This depends on your level of development. Well, friends, it's time to sum up. We will have lectures and practice today. Thank you. I hope that you had received some benefit from this lecture and this this place helped us to talk about these important things. Now let's move to the bus and go to the Bodhi tree.
к дереву Будхи. 